it's important as you meditate that you get a sense of how different ways of breathing affect the body. Which ways of breathing are helpful, which ones are not. Because the body can get out of balance very easily. And it's good to know how to breathe in a way that brings it back into balance. When the energy is too sluggish, how do you breathe in a way that brings it back up? When you're feeling wired, how do you breathe in a way that calms you down? Because you're going to need the body as your friend here as you meditate, as your ally. You want to be able to develop a sense of well-being immediately. You try to get quicker and quicker at noticing how to read the body and bring it back into balance as quickly as possible. So you can have a sense of pleasure, a sense of ease, refreshment, well-being that you can tap into at any time. Otherwise, when you're feeling strung out, it's very easy to side with an emotion that promises to find a different way of calming you down. In fact, this is one of the main strategies of the hindrances. They take over the body. When sensual desire comes on, they have ways of triggering reactions in the body. When anger comes on, they have ways of triggering reactions in the body. Slim with sloth and torpor, restlessness and anxiety and uncertainty. They can hijack the body. So you feel it's not only your mind, but also your body. Deep down something is telling you that you need to go with this particular hindrance. And you don't see it as a hindrance. That's part of the problem. You start seeing things in line with it. When there's desire, the things that you look at and desire really are worth desiring, or the things that are making you angry really are outrageous. When you feel sleepy, you can tell yourself, oh, it's a sign the body needs to rest. Can't meditate so late tonight. When you're worried, the things that have your word really are worthy of worry, even though five minutes ago you hadn't even thought about them. Then ten minutes from now you may not again. But at the time, these hindrances seem so convincing that you don't even see them as hindrances. So you have to learn how to do battle with them. And this is why we need the body as your ally, because it makes it a lot easier when you're feeling balanced, alert, but at ease. These things don't have such power over you. Because one thing that all desires have in common, whether they're skillful or unskillful, is they're aiming at happiness. They just have different ideas of what happiness would be and how you can find it. And so if you have a sense of ease and well-being that you can point to in the present moment, it's right here. feels good breathing in deep down into the heart, into the core of your body. Why would you want to run off and get worked up about something that would destroy that sense of well-being. So that's your, learn, <clears throat> your first line of defense, is learning how to get the body on your side. And then you're going to need a long string of arguments to use against these hindrances, because they have their long string of arguments as well. They're, can be very, they can be very insistent, very persistent. And so you have to be even more insistent and more persistent yourself. If they come up with one or another demand, just learn how to counteract it. As I say, when sensual desire comes up and they say, well, this is a need for the body. The body doesn't need anything. The body, the elements of the body would be perfectly content to die. You're the one who's decided you want them to live and feel a certain way. So it's not the body speaking, it's the mind. You have to probe around in there for a while to see, well, what is it that wants to go in that direction? Then you find some very ingrained habits. But the fact that they're ingrained doesn't mean that they're part of your nature. It's just they're habits. So you want to be able to learn to question them. And even if you can't think of good arguments to use against them, just keep reminding yourself that the Buddha says not to go there. 
Maybe he knows something. We've been following our hindrances for who knows how long. Look where they've gotten us. Maybe it's time to try something else, to look for a different kind of well-being, a different kind of pleasure, a different kind of happiness. And even though the particular hindrance may be wearing you out, insisting that you give in, and promising that you feel better after you've given in, actually it doesn't happen that way. If you've done battle with a hindrance and come out the other side, having won, you have a lot more energy. So remember that the next time a particular hindrance seems to be getting you, getting you down or overcoming you. that you really do benefit from holding out against it. For example, when sloth comes or torpor comes, there is the possibility, of course, that you really do need to rest the body. But before you do that, test it. Try changing your meditation. If the breath is too soothing, try to breathe in a way that's more energizing. Or you might use a contemplation that helps wake you up. You can start thinking about the bones in the body. Where are your finger bones right now? Where are your hand bones, wrist bones? Work your own way up the arms to the shoulders. Then start with the toes, and then work your way up the body through the leg bones and the hip bones and the bones of the spine, the rib cage, all the way up to the skull. Because sometimes sloth and torpor comes from boredom. So change the topic. Probe around is something that's a little more active, has more parts to think about. You can visualize each of the bones and try to get a sense of where each bone lies in the body. And if you notice any tension in that part of the body, allow it to relax so that the meditation develops a sense of well-being. If restlessness arises, Remind yourself that whatever it is you're worried about, you don't know what's going to happen. But you do know that regardless of what's going to happen, you need mindfulness, you'll need alertness, you'll need discernment in order to deal with the problem. So regardless of the problem, you can develop the qualities you're going to need. That gives you a narrative to focus you back. So each of the hindrances has a technique, or has a series of techniques that you can use against them. But the important thing is that you really do want to overcome their influence deep down inside. And that requires that you develop the right attitude as you meditate. Sometimes you think of meditation as a particular technique, and all you have to do is stick the mind in the slot, and the machine will take care of it. Well, it doesn't happen that way. You have to want to do this. This is why the Buddha said that the first factor in right effort, as we chanted just now, chandang janeti, generating desire. You have to sit down with yourself and remind yourself why you're practicing, what you hope to get out of this. Think about all the, the promises that come, a total end of suffering. The path is something that has an end. Your desires, your anger, they never have an end. You satisfy one desire and say, well, how about over here? Make this little change here and try that. And you go for that one. And then you say, how about this one over here? That'll satisfy you. But no, you've had that and it doesn't really satisfy you. So how about this one? Keep going, going, going. And there's never an end to this. The same with anger. You could get worked up about all the different injustices in the world. You solve one, well, there's another one. You solve another, there's still another one. There's no end to these things. It's like the hungry ghost up in the rafters in the story they tell in Thailand. There's a belief that hungry ghosts hang around monasteries because that's where merit is being shared. And this story of one hungry ghost that stayed up in the rafters of this one meditation hall. And a group of people had come to visit the monastery, so they all slept in the meditation hall in the line. And the hungry ghost looked down and he saw that their heads weren't even. So he got down and he pulled them so that all the heads we're nice in a nice row. <clears throat> we're lined up in a nice row. Then he went back up in the rafters, looked down, and the heads looked nice, but then he noticed that the feet were not in line. So he went down and pulled them all so their feet were in line. 
Then he got it back up in the rafters and I said, ah, oh, the heads are not in line. So I went and pulled the heads back, and back and forth, back and forth all night. Nobody got a chance to sleep. That's the way that we are in the world. You fix things in one side and something else goes wrong on another side. So you keep running around, running around. You don't get any rest. Everybody else gets disturbed. There's no end to straightening out the world. There's no end to your desires, no end to your anger, no end to your sloth, no end to your worries, no end to your uncertainty. Unless you decide you want to put an end to it. So think about things. Would you like to put an end to suffering, or do you want to just keep following all the various ins and outs of suffering? It's like all the curlicues in a Mandelbrot set. If you want to discover, explore every little curve, every little line in that set, you're never going to come to the end. But you never really accomplish anything. So remind yourself, you do have the choice, and you have to make the choice. It's not going to happen on its own. It's not the case that the mind, once it gets still, will just naturally drop all its defilements. Many times the still mind cr contains the seeds of a lot more defilements. That's why we can't just do concentration. Discernment has to come in as well. And sometimes discernment is just a matter of noticing things and feeling immediate disenchantment or immediate um, <coughs> dispassion. Sometimes it doesn't work that way. You have to exert, as I said, a fabrication, which means you have to think about things in a new way, breathe in a new way, change your perceptions. And you can finally get past that particular defilement. So it takes work, and as with all work, it requires desire. So, chandang janeti, try to generate that desire that you really do want to put an end to suffering. You've had enough of the sufferings of the world. How much more do you want to suffer? Ask yourself. It's when you ask yourself that question you start getting good answers. And then whatever technique you can think of to hold out against the hindrances. There are ideas that are listed in the texts, but often you have to create your own arguments, your own approaches. That's what discernment is for. We're not just trying to clone the Buddha's discernment. We're trying to develop our own, learn how to be more strategic, learn how to think more, with more ingenuity in this direction. We've used a lot of ingenuity to keep our hindrances going. Well, it's now, <clears throat> now it's time to turn the ingenuity around and work back in the other way, and try to stick with, deep down with that desire that you really do want to put an end to suffering. You really do want to give the Buddha's teachings a try.